Hello, my friend. I've been alone. I've been resting. I've been tired. But I'm here. I'm always here. What What story story do you you want want to hear? Who, me? Yes, Yes, you. you. Who's asking? I I am. am. Oh. All right. This rather audacious and suspiciously familiar spirit asked me what story I want to hear. They just jumped right into it. That's unusual. I have a story. It's been a while since we've had this kind of story time. Perhaps we ought to set the scene a little first. One, two, three. That's better. I've picked the perfect room in your castle for this. Gather by the fire. There are two couches waiting for us there. They seem soft, like if you fell into one it would embrace you like a bed, but hold you upright like a chair, a deep and dark velvet. And it is dark here, dim, for the only light is that of the fireplace, roaring and alive and awake. In stark contrast with everything else in this simple and sleepy room. A storyteller would have to know their story from memory. The fire is too volatile to read by. But if they knew their story by heart, this room could take it and do some absolute magic. I will try again. I will try to tell you a story. A story that I want to tell. Sit across from me. Let's have it. Unusual. I haven't done this in a while. Let me see. Since someone asked, it turns out that I do have a favorite story of all of them. A story of a beautiful girl and a hideous beast. You know it. I have told this story before in at least one other way. Probably more. I easily lose track. Well, here is another beauty and another beast. Because that's what I want right now. Once upon a time... Beauty found her way to a hidden castle deep in the woods one night. The journey was long and cold, even colder for the bitter tears on her cheeks. You see, Beauty had come here on her own, after her father had been attacked by a vicious and mystical beast in this very same castle, attacked for taking a rose. Her poor father, in his fear, asked the beast what he could do to make amends for this trespass, and the beast offered him one lifeline. You are a man with many children. Surely you will not miss one. Send me one of your daughters to live with me. If you do not do this, I will come find you, and I will kill you and your children. See my sharp teeth? I shall feast on you with them. See my long claws? I shall pick your son's bones clean with them. 
see my yellow eyes. They will be the last thing your last daughter will see. So Beauty's father agreed and went home, where he, weeping, told his children of this misfortune. Foolish Beauty, her brother cried. You have destroyed us all. Why did you ask for that rose? Yes, selfish Beauty, her sister wept. We asked for usual things like silks and jewels and perfumes. Who asks for a flower? Oh, beloved Beauty, her father wept. Good, kind Beauty, will you be kind one last time? And so she left. Her heart had hardened in a strange way along her journey. The disbelief stung. Disbelief at what had transpired and how easily she was cast aside. The anger burned, for she knew that she had done no wrong, but arguing would have made everything more difficult for everyone. The sorrow ached for the life she lost, not only because of the bargain, but because her idea of her own worth had been burst so violently. All of that pain and hurt and rage crystallized and turned her heart to stone. So, though she cried, she was numb as she headed towards her destination. The doors opened by themselves and she was let in. They slammed shut behind her, and everything was pitch black. One single candle flickered into view, and glowed just enough that she could see it and only it. Thank goodness you've come. You're our only chance. Who said that? Who is there? She answered. We are the souls who reside here, trapped within the castle until our master is free of his curse. Your master? And where are they? Coming, coming, he is coming. He is almost here. And then the candlelight went out. And as horrifying as the voices of those trapped souls were, the immediate silence now was so much worse. So, you are the one. So, I am the one. What do you do? She didn't know how to answer. What are you for? I am here because you would murder everyone I love if not. And now that you're here? I didn't think that far. <laughs> I suppose not. The monster in the dark took a deep breath. Well, congratulations, you saved your family. You're free to go. And the door swung open. She looked at it, confused, exhausted, furious, afraid. You came here thinking I was a vicious monster capable of murder. Not so. I'm just a liar. She narrowed her eyes at the shadow. 
You're just some fake, then? What, just some bored prince? Some nobleman with nothing else to do? Well, the beast said, casually stepping into the light. No, I don't lie about everything. And before her eyes appeared what she thought was the most vile thing she'd ever laid eyes on. The first thing she noticed was his enormous, gaping mouth, teeth yellow and sharp and dripping with blood. A forked tongue darted in and out seemingly of its own accord, and yellow eyes glowed in that enormous skull. His snout was like a horse's or goat's, and only slightly more human-like, with its flaring nostrils and the sound of its breathing into enormous lungs. Each breath reverberated through the hall. Black, shining horns curled up and away from that strange skull, and a thick gray mane of fur went down his head and neck and back. He stood so tall that he almost touched the ceiling. For all that his mouth and snout and eyes seemed to belong to a rabid animal, he stood tall and with his hands poised casually in his pockets. Absolutely grotesque, she almost thought to herself. Except that there was something in the directness, the nobility, the humanity of his posture that stopped that thought. She didn't move. She stood in awe, trembling. He leaned over, bending at the waist, which landed his face at eye level with hers. The eyes were glowing. His breath smelled of blood. She could hear his huge heart beating, and he whispered, Go! And she ran. As she ran, the strangest things began to happen. A rake jumped in front of her, and a voice hollered, Don't go, you can't go, I won't let you go. The rake, the gardening rake, was talking to her. The rake was threatening her. She grabbed it and threw it as far away from her as she could. A carriage rode after her, bursting through the stable. A voice hollered, Don't be foolish, don't be selfish, go back in there and help us. She pushed it over and it rolled down the hill, pieces splintering and flying away. Then suddenly... Just as she found herself in the midst of a menagerie consisting of unidentifiable animals made of overgrown shrubberies, a gang of gardening tools rose up before her. The watering can struck her across the head. Selfish, selfish, selfish. The gardening gloves pulled at her hair. Where will you go? You're needed here. You're not wanted there. The garden hoe jabbed at her knees and feet. I saw what you did to my friend's rake and carriage. You're not so kind, you're not so good. And that just about did it. She couldn't believe that she was being attacked and berated by gardening equipment. But stranger things had happened to her this week. So whether she fainted from the shock of it or from the pain, everything went black. And next she knew, she was in a wonderfully soft bed, by a delightfully warm fire, and she smelled deliciously sweet cinnamon rolls. She was dressed in fine silks and wearing rare jewels. A nail file was perfecting her manicure, and a brush and a comb were busy braiding her hair. Honey, not vinegar, I kept telling that stupid watering can. The nail file said, You cannot bring love with violence. No, but it can't exist if there's no one here to love, can it? The brush answered, All we can do is what we can do. We can only do what we can do after all. 
said the comb, engrossed in the act of combing. How many of you are there? Beauty asked. All three answered at once, in horrific unison. I have no idea. Could be one, could be thousands. Not always in comb and brush and file, but sometimes in rake and carriage and gloves and candle and clock and whatever we like. But never watering can, one said. No, of course not. Watering can refuses to be anything other than watering can. Another scoffed. They continued all together. We are here, I am here, until he can love and be loved. However many we are, we cannot escape. Not until he can love and be loved. Until then, this is a place for the cursed, for lost souls. And sadly, I think... I also think... I would have to agree that... He does not want to love or be loved. Do Do you? Beauty shook at the sound of these voices, coming from these enchanted and expensive antiques. She did not answer them. Truthfully, she did not have an answer for them anyway. As frightened as she was, when they resumed their ministrations, she couldn't help but admire their beauty. She thought about rake and carriage with some guilt, and hoped they were all right. She thought about every soul she'd met in an inanimate object here. She thought that this might be hell for these souls, and that beast might be the devil. You're probably thinking this is like hell for us, and that the beast is like our devil. Is that it? said Wise Brush. I'm sorry, but yes, that's what I was thinking. Beauty replied. Is it? Is he? They chuckled and muttered a bit among themselves, but they did not answer. Eventually, once she felt well enough, she stood up and walked downstairs. It was a gorgeous staircase with red velvet steps and an immense crystal chandelier above her. The paintings along the wall as she descended took her breath away. She'd never seen art like this. A lovely bit of music played on a distant piano. And it pulled at her heart, and she wanted to hear more. When her knees wobbled in pain and she stumbled, a statue graciously helped her up and they continued on the way down. She blushed at the sight of the stone god wearing only a fig leaf, and it whispered, Don't be embarrassed, this isn't really me, you know. Somehow, that did make her feel a bit less sheepish. Her host was standing there, but his face was in shadow, only his hulking body leaning against the wall, hands still in pockets, visible in the firelight. The door was open, and a carriage waited outside of it with its door open. You can go. I had a talk with carriage. He'll take you home. And back, if you so choose. She clenched her jaw. I shall never return. Why would I do that? In her fine gown, glowing from the care she'd been shown in her quarters, surrounded by art and music that made her heart weep, she heard herself lie. She could just barely see the smirk on his horrible mouth in the shadow. Why, indeed... She got in the carriage, who had promptly apologized to her. It was so warm and comfortable inside, and the ride was very smooth and swift. She fell into a deep sleep, and she dreamed of the master of the castle. Nothing too specific, 
He was just there with her, looking at her with those horrible yellow eyes, smiling with those awful yellow teeth, still dripping with blood, always. Sitting across from her in the carriage. In the dream, she hated him a little, but she was also glad he was there somehow. But when the carriage stopped and the door swung open, she was jostled awake, and he was gone. And she looked at her family's home. Suddenly, her stomach turned as she realized she had no idea what to do next. She took a step out of the carriage, opened the gate, and went to the front door, just as she'd done hundreds of times before in her life. Yet now it seemed like completely unknown territory. She knocked on the door, and her father answered, and he turned white instantly as did every sister and brother within the house at the dinner table. There was some weeping and embracing, for a little while. She explained the strange things that had happened, and everyone gasped. And something caught her eye, shimmering in her sister's ears. Diamond earrings and her brother wore a fine ruby in his necktie, and her father had a sumptuous jeweled necklace. She looked over in the corner, where a chest full of treasure stood. No wonder Carriage knew how to get here. Her father apologized. He explained that they thought she was lost forever, so they accepted the gifts. She forgave him, at least out loud. Then they sat at the table and resumed dinner, and each went to bed, like nothing had ever happened. She lay in her bed in the empty bedroom, for they had discarded all of her things or divided them amongst themselves. All but the rose, which hung upside down from the window so that it could dry up and be preserved. A dead rose. As she lay in bed looking at the mostly full moon from her window, the rose in her view, she wondered what she'd do tomorrow. She could help out at home, surely, but being here hurt. These people, for all that she loved them, hurt her. She didn't know if it would ever be the same. She could move out, start again, somewhere, with a clean slate. But who would need her there? Who needed her here? Her eyelids grew heavy as she weighed her life in this hometown against her single night in the Beast's Castle. She drifted off to sleep the smell of the dead rose filling her dreams. And he was with her again. Just sitting there, staring at her with those eyes. And she stared back at him. In her dream, she was in the hallway of the castle, on the stairs again. He stood there, eyes glowing in the shadows. They just watched each other. She began to hear the cries of the souls in the castle, begging her for help, begging him for help, moaning about loving and being loved, something like that. But the beast raised his clawed hand, monstrous and huge, and they were silenced. And they just kept looking at each other. She woke at the break of dawn before anyone else. She left the dead rose on the kitchen table so they'd know she was well. She couldn't take the weight of their shame, 
or her own bitter resentment of them either. She knew this would be easier. She stepped outside and carriage was still there. He woke up with a start and flung his door open. She got in, and she went back. She dreamed of the beast the entire way. He stared at her, at first smirking as though he had won. And she detested that smugness. But then he seemed a little perplexed, as though he were trying to read her thoughts and failing. The doors opened as soon as she arrived, and she woke up as she heard the ghosts cheering and crying for joy. The torches lit themselves one by one, guiding her to the study, where she found two comfortable couches by a fire, facing each other. Beauty now found herself sitting across from the beast who'd haunted her waking life and her dark dreams. As his yellow eyes burned and his fangs dripped with fresh blood, and his horns shone in the firelight, the thing she was the most frightened by once again was how very aware he seemed. A very lucid beast. For he'd crossed his enormous legs just as a petulant prince might. He rested his long, clawed finger under his chin, like a devious rogue, and his strange and bloody lips curved into a smirk, like a wise fool. It would be one thing if he was just a mindless animal, a fierce tiger, or an angry lion, or a provoked bear. The way he seemed so very intelligent was the most frightful thing. Are you going to ask me if I will love you? She asked him. No, I think not. I think I've done with all that. Besides, I could tell from the time we spent together in your dreams that it is a futile pursuit. He became interested suddenly in a bit of dirt that had been caught under his claw, and so he busied himself with tidying his nails as he spoke. It is not something one can force anyway. Honey and vinegar and all that. So, will you kill me? He scoffed. <laughs> no, I think not. I haven't the taste for that. Besides, then I'd just have to find someone else, and I really can't think of anyone who could be more accommodating than you. I think these fools are right, and you are our last hope. But nothing is ever promised. We can only do what we can do. I certainly don't love you. She thought for a long time, and her heart unhardened a little. The disbelief returned and stung at her. How could someone be so callous, so empty, so unfeeling? The anger returned and burned her. She had given her whole life, and he didn't even care. The sorrow returned and made her ache. If she didn't even have him, then what on earth did she have? Finally, she spoke. You assaulted my father. You threatened my family. You bought me out of their hearts with riches. You torment my dreams. You torment these souls here. His face was a little grim. Yes, all of that. She thought for a long time again. She looked at her gown. She thought of her gifts, the art here, the care she'd received. She looked at him and she found she could not quite hate him. She spoke again. You have given me beautiful gifts. You saved my life and nursed me back to health. You have sent my family support and wealth. His face barely softened. Yes, all of that. She looked at him again, and she found she could not quite love him either. 
I don't know what to feel. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. He nodded slowly, arched a brow, and leaned forward in the chair. May I point out something to you, beauty? She nodded slowly, arched a brow, and leaned forward in the chair. He continued. So now what? The worst has come. The worst is gone. You have seen what cannot be unseen, felt what cannot be unfelt. It is awful outside the castle. It is awful within the castle. It is awful inside your heart. You hate and you sting and burn and ache because that is what you feel and so that is what you see and that is what you are. Where are you in all of this? I've been looking and looking and it's so hard to find. Where are you? If every little decision you made within these walls didn't affect me, or your family, or my subjects, what would you do? Where are you, beauty? Where are you, beast? She snapped back. It is your cruelty, your temper, your lack of feeling that has caused all this to begin with. You cannot tear my life apart and expect me to know how to put it together again. Oh, beauty. The beast sighed and shook his head. Sometimes there is just the breaking. Indeed. Now allow me to ask a question of you, beast. Go ahead. Why were you and all the souls here cursed? I treated the people who worked here as though they were in hell, and as though I were the devil. A witch with a strange sense of irony decided to make it so. But that's not fair to those souls. No. No, it's not, is it? <laughs> Sometimes there is just the breaking. Exactly. The two were leaning forward in their seats, looking into each other's eyes with an unflinching, probing gaze. As though they were each trying to see past the clutter of what had happened, what he'd done, how she'd reacted, what had happened to him before that, what she might do yet. Clutter and noise, clutter and noise, and it was so hard to see past it, to the glow of a way forward. How are you right now? She asked him. I am calm. I do not wish to hurt anyone. I am sorrowful that you will not love me. Yet because I cannot in all honesty say that I love you either, I am resigned. I am peaceful now. How are you right now? I am calm. I find that I do not hate you, but I do not love you either. I keep feeling that I should make a decision on that, yet I cannot. For you have done evil, yes, but you have also done good. I am confused, but I am peaceful now. He reclined a little, keeping his eyes on hers as though afraid of looking away. She followed his lead and leaned back too, yet neither broke the gaze. If we stay here like this, maybe... We can keep this feeling? Yes, that's what I'm wondering. There's nothing for me from my past, she whispered. Nor for me from mine, he agreed. The future holds no power over me, she whispered. Worthless and non-existent, he agreed. Right now, I am at peace, she whispered. Right now, I am at peace, he agreed. And so, 
they began a strange kind of staring contest. It lasted quite some time, mostly in huge pockets of silence. Occasionally conversation happened, sometimes more angry, sometimes more kind, but it always ended with, Right now, I am still at peace. And they resumed the staring contest, as though the second they looked away or went to their separate rooms, they would be left alone with their thoughts, and hate and pain and frustration and desire and longing would creep back in the night. I cannot say how much time passed, for this is magic. A minute might be a day here, an hour, a year. Who's to say what happens to time in a magic castle? But I will tell you this, in my version, perhaps this might happen. Perhaps one day, a merchant was passing by the castle, and he was curious, a little too curious for his own good, and he came close to the gate. He saw a handful of people, clinging to filthy rags, though quite clean themselves, yet each of them scrambling to both find clothes for themselves and get far away from the castle as quickly as possible at the same time. Hey, he called to them. Do you need help? What's happened? Are you all right? Oh, we're, we're quite, quite all right, right indeed. They shouted back, all in unison, and the merchant was surprised to see that they were smiling and laughing despite what he presumed to be their unfortunate situation. He decided they were mad and went on his journeying. Yet he couldn't help but smile at the way they sang the words. It happened! I can't believe it finally happened! How did it happen? We're free! 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 What happens in your version? What happens when the awful out there becomes so heavy that it begins to drag you down? Do you let it? Does it turn you rotten? Or do you rage against it so ardently that the beautiful inside you begins to leak out and become the beautiful out there? Or even more yet, can you look at it all in the eye and accept that it's all there, every single part of it, the dark in the light? the light in the dark, each with its terror, each with its beauty. And if you can see it out there, it's within you, too. That is why we must keep imagining beautiful and terrible things. Keep imagining beautiful and terrible things. I shall burn it into a wooden plaque and hang it above the front door of my heart. Our fire is still going strong in this little story room. You don't have to stay if you want to go now. I'm going to stay here and have a staring contest with whoever wants to. I will stay here and keep looking it all in the eye. I think I need to do that this week. And somehow, even in that, right now, I am at peace. How are you? Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 210 of On a Dark Cold Night. This is your host, writer, narrator, podcaster, composer, etc. behind the podcast, Kristen Zaza. 
I hope you're doing well. Thank you for your patience with this week's release. I'm just getting over a bad cold and needed to take some time to rest and recover. Just a heads up that this week's later release and a rather busy weekend coming up might mean that there may be no episode coming up this Monday. I'll see what I can do and do my best, but this month is proving to be a little tricky for me, so we'll see what happens. Big thanks today to our question asker, me. I decided I wanted to ask myself a rather decadent question, do a little introspection, see what I needed, and I came up with yet another Beauty and the Beast. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes when there is so much going on in our lives, as there often is, I find that it can be overwhelming to focus on just one problem or to find a place of quiet and calm where I can work on finding a solution to one issue at a time. Work, family, money, friends, taking care of myself, my home, others, getting enough sleep, finding time to allow myself to rest, while also carving time to get everything done that I need to do. If you're anything like me, it can feel like a lot to juggle sometimes. And it's okay to need a little help to learn how to become a better problem solver and accomplish your goals, whether they're big, scary ones or little gentle ones. Therapy can be a wonderful way to find guidance and learn how to solve these problems and not let yourself get overwhelmed by them. I've found through therapy lots of techniques to help calm my thoughts and find a path forward, and sometimes just the option to let everything out to someone you trust can work wonders too. BetterHelp is a great option for anyone looking to try therapy. It's all online and affordable and so easy to access. All you need to do is fill out a brief survey and you can get matched with a therapist, and if you find you'd like to try someone else, you can switch therapists anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash goodnight today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash goodnight. Sending lots of gratitude out this week to my newest supporter on Patreon, Jamie Marcus. Thank you so much, Jamie. It means the world to me. If you'd like to support the show on a monthly basis like Jamie Marcus, I'll tell you a bit about the perks you can receive. Every patron of $1 or more a month gets access to my complete soundtrack, while every patron of $5 or more gets that and a monthly tarot reading video I upload every full moon. Learn more at patreon.com slash darkcoldnight. You can also donate one time only without those perks at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight or you can buy a t-shirt or a hoodie at bonfire.com slash on-a-dark-cold-night. I'd also love it if you left me a rating and a review on iTunes, Spotify, Facebook, or wherever else you like to rate and review podcasts, though it'd be especially helpful if you did so over iTunes or Spotify. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at a dark cold night, Instagram at dark cold night podcast, on Facebook or YouTube at on a dark cold night, or on TikTok at Kristen Zaza. You can use any of those means, or via Patreon or Coffee too, to ask me a question that you might want to hear answered in an upcoming story, so please feel free to reach out any of those ways. Thank you so much for listening. This was a long one. I guess I needed to get a fairy tale out of my system this week. Thank you as well for your patience. Take care of yourselves. Listen to what you need and take a deep breath, and rest well, my friends. Good night. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network. Sonar.